This is Francis Sadeco with Blake Johnson from IBM. He is a, a distinguished engineer with IBM, uh, in charge of uh, really architecting a lot of the Qiskit solutions and the, and the quantum solutions. Uh, so I'm talking to him here at IBM Think 2024. He's gonna uh, walk us through uh, the recently, recently released uh, Qiskit 1.0 but, but it really goes just further uh, you know, past just the SDK. It, it, it brings it all the way down uh, to the hardware systems and, and running these circuits uh, optimized on these circuits, so, or on these systems. So, so Blake, uh, go ahead. Great, thanks, Francis. Uh, so, like you just said, I want to introduce you to Qiskit. This is the kind of the other half of the, the critical equation to, to enabling users to do uh, utility scale uh, work with, with quantum computing systems. Uh, where Qiskit, uh, combined with IBM's powerful uh, quantum computing systems, uh, sort of allows users to enter this new era of utility scale quantum. So, as Francis mentioned, uh, the demo today uh, hopes to introduce you to uh, the Qiskit uh, software stack. Uh, the Qiskit stack includes many components now, both uh, services and tools uh, that uh, uh, help the, the developer in their journey to uh, taking advantage of quantum computers. So a little bit, uh, so the demo is going to touch on several components you see uh, on the screen here, um, but let's start with the Qiskit SDK uh, and, and what that is. So the Qiskit Software Development Kit is, is really the de facto standard for creating, optimizing, and executing quantum circuits and operators. Uh, it is the, the tool which is um, uh, preferred by the vast majority of quantum software developers, uh, thanks in large part to a, a model which allows for sort of write once and, and run anywhere, so that you can run uh, the same code uh, on practically any uh, hardware quantum hardware vendor uh, or architecture. And the the syntax of that is is Python, right? So there's already a lot of people that know how to write in Python. Exactly. Um, uh, will it stay Python, or you know, it it, it, it looked like you know, just from the slides that I've seen, uh, there might be you know some other types of syntaxes that you guys are going to start using, like Rust, uh, to help with with some of the things you're trying to do. Sure. Uh, so I'd say Qiskit has uh, we focused on on exposing Python interfaces because that's uh, a popular programming language among our uh, our current set of users. Uh, but the services are all uh, uh, exposed with REST APIs so that they can be you can interface with them from a variety of tools. And we have a variety of partners that have, have looked to, to integrate uh, some capability with IBM's quantum systems through our service interfaces. For instance, uh, MathWorks uh, last year introduced a, um, a plug-in to their quantum uh, toolbox uh, it allows you to 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 use the Qiskit runtime uh, primitives uh, through through Mat, Mat, uh, through MATLAB. So, um, but like you said, we're looking towards the future, towards uh, use cases that integrate quantum with high performance computing. And in that setting, um, oftentimes uh, the the HPC uh, developer uh, reach, reaches more for systems programming languages like C plus plus and Rust, and so. Uh, we are certainly investigating the future, extending the Qiskit universe to sort of have more direct integration uh, with systems programming languages. Perfect. Uh, but cer certainly it's fair to say that Qiskit is uh, uh, first a sort of an experience which uh, targets Python. Uh, so just a few quick, quick stats, uh, statistics about Qiskit. Uh, so the Qiskit uh, user community includes over 550,000 uh, users of IBM's quantum, uh, quantum systems. Um, they've, those users have executed over 3 trillion circuits, um, and the Qiskit SDK code repository includes over 8,000 code commits from over 500 contributors, many of whom are outside of IBM. So it is a thriving, uh, a, a thriving uh, development ecosystem. Uh, but the Qiskit SDK had a major milestone this past March uh, with the release of version 1.0. Built on over 100 previous releases, uh, we, Qiskit, the Qiskit SDK is now more uh, performant, more stable, and more reliable than ever before. We like to say that Qiskit has come of age. Um, and in order to show you how the Qiskit uh, tooling works, I want to introduce you to uh, a kind of a framework or recipe we've developed over the past uh, couple of years that uh, helps a user in, uh, in 
and applying uh, quantum to an application or algorithm. It's something that we call the Kiska pattern. So it has four steps. In step one, you map your, your problem from, a, from your classical description into a quantum description in the form of a quantum circuits and, and observables. In step two, you optimize those quantum inputs for execution on quantum hardware. In step three is the actual quantum part where you're going to use uh, the Qiskit runtime to manage uh, execution environment, exposes quantum execution through primitives uh, to actually run your quantum inputs on the quantum systems. And if step four is a post-processing step where you translate the output of your quantum execution back into the domain of the problem you're trying to solve. So the demo I'm going to show today. Uh, we'll so, so sorry, Blake. Before you move on from that, I mean, one thing that you know that I've learned from previous conversations is that's not necessarily a one-shot deal. That's an iterative process uh, that that you go through to continue to get better and better results. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, any particular application may uh, may use uh, multi these steps multiple times. Uh, but it's also so it's iterative both within the context of a specific application or algorithm but also just like in the process of making new applications new algorithms uh, we find that this pattern appears over and over again as a useful way to construct uh, the process of how, of how you take advantage of quantum Perfect. so our particular uh example the demo i'm going to show today is uh we're going to solve a max cut problem MaxCut is a, is a hard to solve optimization problem with applications in clustering, network science, and statistical physics. Uh, you can, for instance, uh, see applications in like placement of distribution centers, VLSI circuit design, or study of material systems like uh, spin glass systems and so on. And there's lots of, lots of uh, use cases where uh, MaxCut arises uh, in sort of with concrete real world application. So what makes this type of problem hard for classical computers to do, but easier with quantum computers? Well, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, these kinds of problems uh, become intractable when you have uh, a large number of, of nodes that are trying to be, uh, so the optimization problem gets large. Uh, and it's also a constrained optimization, can also, when you choose constraints, uh, can become uh, hard classically. Um, but any sort of time that you have uh, a lot of structure, um, uh, is, uh, the fact that there's often structure underlying the, the problem description is, is what sort of intrinsically allows a quantum approach to, to, to find a, a kind of a, find a way in. Um, uh, uh, I think we'll, we may have to leave it at there because otherwise we could spend the next 15 minutes just talking about that topic specifically. Sure, it's, no it's, worries. It's, it's maybe, a a, maybe a follow-up video. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, okay, Max Scott, uh, uh, we've talked about, uh, kind of the settings in which it appears. Uh, the particular problem uh, is a problem in, in graphs. Uh, so those uh, you know, kind of mathematical object where you have nodes connected by edges. Um, and uh, if you thought of, think of like the, the shipping distribution center uh, example I talked about before, for instance, these nodes might represent distribution centers and the edges would represent, for instance, the distance between them. Uh, and in MaxCut, the goal is to partition the, the graph into two sets or to cut it such that the maximum number of edges cross your cut. Um, so you can see that uh, sort of in kind of mathematical form there as, a, as an optimization problem and as a minimization problem. All right, so now that's the problem we're gonna solve. Now what does this look like uh, in code using Qiskit tooling to solve it? So first of all, we gotta, to, 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 to start with, we need an example problem to solve. So here I have a, a little bit of Python code that's going to create a, a random graph and then and visualize it. So you can see uh, this is kind of collection of random collection of nodes and edges, of, uh, which is in the code stored in a variable g, which is the problem we're going to going to solve. All right. So now we're ready ready to enter the Qiskit pattern into step one. We need to map this problem into a quantum description. So we need to go from this graph g into quantum circuits and observables. And I'm going to do that uh, in this particular case with an eye towards how I want to solve the problem. So I'm going to use an algorithm known as the quantum alternating operator ansatz or QAOA um, and uh, to solve it. And so first, I actually, I'm going to represent my problem, the, the kind of the cost function of any particular uh, solution with its embedding in, a, in, in, in quantum bits uh, in a 
an observable. That's this variable on the screen here that you see called Hamiltonian. And then I'm going to reuse that same observable with uh, a function from Qiskit's circuit library, which is the QAOA ansatz uh, uh, library element, to construct a quantum circuit, a QAOA quantum circuit. So you see here, it just looks like a, a big block, a single block that says QAOA. We can actually use uh, Qiskit to unpack that block to see what's inside. And now you see uh, this structure kind of big, small, big, small, which is the, the kind of the alternating structure that gives QAOA its name. Um, so some of our viewers, this may be the first time they're seeing a quantum circuit. So just a little bit, uh, a few words about how to, how to interpret quantum circuits, how to read them. So you, you read quantum circuits a lot like reading music. So time flows left to right. Uh, but our music staff, instead of sort of each uh, line representing a, sort of a different musical note, in this case, the, each wire we call them in a quantum circuit represents uh, a quantum bit or qubit. And you see uh, uh, the kind of the, the notes on our staff are, are operations. So you have the ones that connect qubits are, are two qubit gates. The ones that are localized to a specific wire are single qubit instructions. And the things that look like uh, gauge or dials at the end are measurements, quantum measurements that convert a quantum bit into a classical bit. Uh, we're also going to talk about the depth of a quantum circuit, which in our music analogy is kind of like the duration of the song uh, measured in the number of beats. So it's the number of distinct time slices uh, in, 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 uh, in the quantum circuit. I've never heard it explained that way, but it's, it's awesome. It's a great way to really understand it from a layperson's point of view. Not, not you know, you don't have to be a physicist to understand it. Actually, it looks like a ukulele staff, so. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, all right, so now we, in step one, we created our quantum, uh, quantum circuit and observable. Now we need to optimize it for execution because what we have so far is still kind of a mathematical abstraction. It's a transformation that we want to perform on some qubits, uh, but now we need to synthesize um, that circuit into the specific instructions and connectivity of a specific quantum computer. And to do that, we're going to use a transpiler. So the Qiskit SDK includes a, a powerful and flexible transpiler uh, that can really be configured in a variety, uh, in a myriad of ways. We're going to, in this particular case, uh, I'm going to show an example where I'm using a preset pass manager, a, a preset uh, transpiler pipeline to uh, transform or transpile my circuit for execution. And when we visualize it, what you see uh, looks like a lot, like a much bigger circuit. Like there's a lot going on here. Uh, and that's because we've taken those um, sort of mathematical abstractions and synthesize them into the specific instructions that are supported by the hardware that we're going to use. So that's the experience that you get uh, generating what we call ISA or instruction set architecture circuits with the Qiskit SDK. The Qiskit stack though now uh, is has ex extended and now it includes uh, an AI enhanced transpilation capability uh, through a, what we call the Qiskit transpiler service. Uh, so this is uh, another way to transpile circuits that uh, in practice for the user is just as simple as the local experience. But now I just make a, a, a call to um, this remote service, which is going to use uh, a, a model reinforcement learning uh, a trained model uh, to, to um, optimize the circuit in different ways. And the, the code here continues to look at compare the, uh, the local experience, the SDK uh, transpiled circuits with the AI enhanced transpiled circuits. And you see it, it calculates the, um, the total instruction count and the circuit depth for, for each. And you can see that in this particular case, the AI uh, enhanced uh, transpiler gave us about a 20 to 25% improvement in both of those metrics. All right, so we finished step two. We have uh, circuits and observables in a form we can actually execute on hardware. So now we're going to proceed to step three using a managed execution environment known as the Qiskit runtime, which exposes execution through computational primitives. And in, uh, there's several of them, the sampler and estimator in particular. Uh, for this particular use case, I'm going to use the sampler, which is going to uh, collect the outcome of executing the circuit many times. And in this particular case, I'm going to execute it about 10,000 times and look at the distribution of outcomes I see. There's one step I'm going to gloss over this QAOA circuit, we had the big, small, big, small structure. Each one of those blocks it has a parameter. Uh, in the process of finding the, the, the optimal values for those parameters, kind of out of our scope of our demo, we're just going to plug in good parameter values that have been found elsewhere 
before making a call to uh, to the sampler. So here we go. We make we plug in our our, our circuit and those optimized parameters into a, a request to the sampler. We get back a job, uh, and then we get the, the the result of execution when it's when it's done uh, back from the service, and we can get um, the, the sort of accounts or distribution of the the measurement results from that the ends of, the, of those uh, circuits. And it's important for everybody to know that going from step two to step three, that's really where you go. You know, up until step two, it's it's hardware agnostic. You don't necessarily have to run it on IBM, you know, systems, but quantum systems. But what, going into step three, where you're optimizing it for the hardware itself, that's obviously, you know, a value add if they decide to use IBM quantum computers because yeah. uh, otherwise they'd have to do all this optimization themselves right for the specific uh, for the specific hardware that they use right so in step two we went from sort of hardware agnostic to yeah. now sort of hardware specific yeah. right now it's now it's now circuits which have been optimized and targeted to a specific piece of hardware so step three though we then actually ran uh, on a real quantum computer right and so step four now is where we're, we're going to post-process the, the result of that quantum execution to translate the outcome back into the max cut uh, problem domain, right? Into the language of our original problem. So I have a little function here that converts uh, each observed bit string, those zeros and ones, into its corresponding uh, cost in the max cut uh, uh, graph G. Uh, and then I'm gonna visualize, uh, since we have 10,000 instances, 10,000 examples, I'm gonna visualize uh, the, the kind of range of outcomes by showing you a cumulative distribution function uh, uh, of the costs observed in those uh, 10,000 samples. And the particular representation I chose, uh, better cost is, is lower, so good values are on the left. And we can take the best observed cost and translate that into a coloring or a partition of the, the graph. And so you can see here then finally the solution uh, that's been found uh, using this Kiskit pattern to our max cut problem. Now you mentioned that you selected a specific uh, format for a representation for the data. That selection and 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 picking that, uh, I assume that's all in the Qiskit environment. That you know for step four, where they can you know choose different types of representation, whatever is best for that. So that method. representation we we kind of chose in step one. Oh, okay. Uh, and there, there's actually a lot of flexibility. Kiskit will support you uh, in different, uh, uh, different encodings, different representations. Um, and but then there's also um, we're kind of developing examples through what we call building blocks, which uh, include different pieces that help you uh, with multiple choices of, of embeddings or encodings. And and maybe why pick one versus the other? I mean, most of these developers are pretty mathematical in nature, so they probably have an understanding of which one to pick. But I assume as as this becomes more widely spread, you know, there needs to be some kind of maybe guidance on hey, for this type of problem, maybe use this type of representation. Yeah, for, for sure. Uh, actually, that's a great uh, transition to the, the last thing I want to show in the demo, which is a new generative AI tool that helps users through this journey of, of making their own Qiskit patterns. Right? So this is something called the Qiskit Code Assistant. Uh, it's a, a service in Visual Studio Code Extension. Uh, so this is a, a generative AI tool built using Watson X. Um, that uh, you know brings uh, assistance in, in writing code uh, using Qiskit directly in the developer's development environment. All right, so uh, this is something that we're releasing now um, to our uh, to, uh, IBM Quantum Premium customers, um, and the, I can show you this in practice, back with our our Max Scott example that we were just uh, looking at. Kind of winding back to step one, where we're doing this uh, encoding our uh, step, where we're going to map our our, our max cut graph into a, a quantum circuit and observable. Before I showed you that experience, where I sort of did it by hand, but instead here you can just describe what you want to do in English, uh, and the service is going to respond with a code completion that completes the task. And in fact, what it what it does here uh, is remarkably similar to what I did uh, by hand. And that that's the and that's AI and that's, driven that's, from and it's using Granite as a model. It's, it's using a a Granite model that's been fine tuned uh, using a, a corpus of Qiskit code examples. 
Awesome. Now, after seeing this video, if some of some of your potential enterprise customers wanted to engage with you on Kiskit, what's their first step? Who do they call? Do they just talk to their IBM account rep, or what? What do they got to do? Uh, that is certainly one place you can go. I, we also have a lot of uh, great resources online that can help you get started. There's, uh, in particular, we have a, uh, a learning uh, learning platform. Uh, with a lot of courses, tutorials, and other information that can help uh, you and your teams uh, kind of get up to speed on quantum. Uh, that's same sort of series of websites uh, have uh, lots of links that help you get in, in touch with our team if you want to learn more as well. Perfect. Blake, thanks for showing us this. Any last, last thoughts before we wrap up? Uh, it's an exciting time in quantum. We've really entered a, a new uh, era where... Um, we're no longer just using these tools uh, to kind of learn how to build better quantum computers and understand quantum computing. We're really using them as tools for scientific discovery. Um, and I think that's, um, uh, I'm really excited to see what happens in the next few years as people uh, use these more powerful tools uh, to really uh, advance the state of the art of what we can do um, in a variety of disciplines. Perfect. Well, thanks for showing us this. It's, it's very exciting to uh, see quantum going from the learning phase to the doing phase. Uh, so very excited. Thanks, Blake. Appreciate it. Yeah, cheers.